Good morning, everyone. My name is Gina Wood, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Partnerships and Impact at the Atlantic Council. On behalf of our President and CEO, Fred Kemp, I'm pleased to welcome you to this event on Women, Peace, and Security 2030, Integrating Lessons Learned from Afghanistan. This October marks 21 years since the United Nations Senior Security Council passed Resolution 1325, which created the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, or WPS for short. With 1325, the UN addressed for the first time the impact of armed conflict on women and recognized them for the contributions they make to prevent conflict and build lasting peace. The WPS agenda aims to involve women more directly in peace and security processes and ensure a gendered perspective is integrated into policy decision making. WPS was incorporated in NATO's Afghanistan operations starting in 2007, seven years into the alliance's mission there. Its policy was based on the principles of integration, inclusiveness, and integrity and practical steps like integrating gender advisors, which is a step in the right direction. But after the tragic recent events, what happens next under the Taliban regime is unclear. Here at the Atlantic Council, we believe that our core mission of strengthening the transatlantic relationship is best served by engaging people of all genders. We want to better understand what happened in Afghanistan so we can learn from this experience to better protect and empower women worldwide not only in international operations, but also in our daily practices here at home. Gender and security is an area that the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security is actively leading on to incorporate with the Atlantic Council's goal of shaping the global future together. The Scowcroft Center works to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. The center honors General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embodies his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership in cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to supporting the next generation of global leaders. With these principles in mind, I want to thank you again for tuning in today and encourage you to join the conversation online by tweeting at Atlantic Council and at AC Scowcroft with the hashtag Stronger with Allies and also the hashtag UNSCR1325. There will be an opportunity for Q&A later in the event. So please share with your questions on social media and with the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. To begin our event, I'm honored to welcome Ms. Claire Hutchison, former NATO Special Representative for Women, Peace and Security and previous senior gender advisor with the United Nations, who will be joined in a fireside chat with Ms. Sarah Don Petrin, a WPS consultant and former senior civilian advisor to NATO. Sarah, I'll hand it over to you to get us started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. I'm so pleased to be here today with you, Claire. It's an honor to uh, share this moment with you as you wrap up your tenure as the special representative of the Secretary General for Women, Peace and Security. And just recognizing that um, you're uh, fresh from uh, serving in this uh, unique and challenging role. I was just wondering if you could reflect a little bit on your service at NATO headquarters and how you socialize the WPS agenda within NATO. Yes, thank you, Sarah. It's great to see you again. And uh, thanks to the Atlantic Council uh, for the invitation and, uh, and greetings to everyone from beautiful Nova Scotia. Um, NATO, similar to the UN, uh, has taken a while uh, to get women, peace and security uh, into a place where it becomes more comfortable. And as mentioned in 2007, the first policy was adopted. Um, but at the time, it focused very much on operations, on ISAF, uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why it, it rooted so well in NATO. It wasn't until 2018, I would think, in the policy that we introduced, which did bring to uh, the forefront the three principles of integration, inclusiveness, and integrity. And we focused very much 
not necessarily on the operations side, but very much on the headquarters side, looking at how do we integrate. Because as we know, you can put women into positions, you can, you can uh, account numbers, but if the framework for integration or mainstreaming, whichever you want to call it, if that isn't there, then you're only looking at half uh, the, the result. It's, it's not full equality. So a lot of the work we did it was focusing on integration. And some of the practical uh, steps we took, uh, for example, we initiated an award, which I'm not necessarily a great fan of awards, but um, this was an award to a division uh, that, was looking to aspire to implement one piece and security. And so, for example, uh, Defense Planning and Defense Investment both won these awards. And, and we saw a great change uh, because NATO has made sweeping change. And some of these uh, tools to help convince and move forward uh, the conversation on one piece and security were very successful. Um, but we also give the tools which I think are important, for example, the sex disaggregated data manual, the language inclusive language manual. And this is where nations really got on board. Um, nations were very much the driver in women, peace and security. And while not all nations are at the same place, at the same level, uh, they unanimously adopted our policies on not only combating sexual exploitation and abuse, but also conflict related sexual violence uh, and, and robustly uh, supported the policy and the action plan on women, peace and security. So I think both in the military committee and in the NAC, the, the support of nations has been phenomenal. And I, I hope that this continues into the future, I'm sure it will. But integration really is the foundation for anywhere, for any organization and, and absolutely for NATO and accountability as well as getting it into the real strategic documents like the strategic concept that's going to come up. Um, this is critical and this is where I think we need to have uh, more concentration on getting it into the, the key, the doctrine, the capsule documents. Yeah, thank you for that. As you stated, NATO is an alliance of nations and each nation has its own journey with the women, peace and security agenda. And this makes serving in a leadership role at NATO particularly unique. As you work to develop relationships within the nations, um, what would you say worked well in terms of the leadership uh, and management style that you took to uh, moving forward with this agenda? Well, you know, I am very passionate about this agenda um, and have been for the last 20 plus years I've worked on it. And, and I do believe that the, the commitment um, to change um, has to be genuine. And, and, and while you can have some nations that may be a little bit more resistant, but if you make sense of why this is important, um, then I do think you have traction. And we've seen that, that this was part of our strategy. But in terms of leadership, I mean, as a woman in leadership anywhere, we still have glass ceilings and glass floors. And when you work in women, peace and security, I think there is still a burden um, on you to have a different kind of perspective. The idea that you as a woman will carry all women's issues, as they will call it, um, is, is false and it's also damaging. And I also don't believe that there's female leadership and male leadership. I think leadership is the, it has the same qualities or should have and empathy and engagement and communications are all part of that. But I do think in terms of leadership on women, peace and security, it is critical that you have both men and women on leadership in this. And some of the biggest support we had in NATO was from some of the men uh, at the council, uh, some of the, the, the men who are ambassadors. Um, and so it wasn't and should never be a division between women and men. It has to be a partnership. And moving this forward by making sure that the nations understood this isn't just values. While we do have the values of NATO and very much are um, accountable to those values, this was about security. This is about good security and good defense. And this is about how we lead nations into security and defense. And how do we make sure that the strategic is connected to the, both the operational, but that we, we understand the risk and threats if we don't incorporate gender into the work we do. Uh, not only operationally, but in our back in our backyards. What does that mean for our nations? And and the risk 
is there if we don't incorporate gender perspectives. It very much is there in new and emerging risks and threats. Yeah, and I want to talk about future threats now because NATO uh, did the 2030 report, which reflected on the value of the women, peace and security agenda. But NATO is also developing a new strategic concept. And so I'm curious, as we look to the future of what this agenda can do, where do you see new and emerging threats like cybersecurity, hybrid warfare, and maybe other uh, non-traditional uh, armed actors coming into the picture? What can the WPS agenda contribute to this new security landscape? Yeah. You know, I it's 21 years. And uh, sometimes I think the agenda suffers from a bit of a dated rhetoric. Um, if we think about, you know, there are 10 women, peace and security resolutions that have uh, throughout the years taken on more and more in terms of new security analysis or the risks and threats we have to security. And, you know, part of the title is security. Um, initially, 1325 didn't even reference m military engagement. It wasn't really about that. But as we've moved forward, uh, we see the the sort of the holistic uh, view that this agenda can bring. And one of the areas is in terms of cyber. Um, but we also look at uh, climate change. We have to look at energy security. The, all of those security areas that right now don't incorporate a gender perspective. Sorry about that. A gender perspective um, that must um, be incorporated. And, and, you know, this is in terms of we see in cyber the idea that not only in a workforce, if we do not get more women into the workforce, into cyber, uh, we'll have a shortfall. But also we, we have a, a lack of the gender perspective in terms of risks and threats um, to what can happen. The future of women, peace and security is very much entwined with the future of emerging security risks. What, where we stand on climate change, um, who is disproportionately impacted, and how do we move this forward? Now, NATO is doing a lot of great work in terms of climate change, really putting the, the gender perspective into this, looking at, at, at terrorism and countering terrorism, again, as a huge uh, component of, of uh, gender, women, peace and security. But I really do feel we have to do more, especially on cyber. We have to make sure that we have safe spaces for women. I think COVID has opened up a great potential in terms of, of technology. But we've also seen the downside of it in terms of misogyny online, we've uh, looking at the women who have been threatened, and, and this is not new, this has been going on for years. So again, we have to do a framework of protection around cyber, and we have to bring women's voices into this. Quite often we're doing or developing strategies in software development, we're developing artificial intelligence, without having a gender perspective or women's voices included. And so the output of that is that we have a, a one, one fits all framework that really doesn't fit all because women are not included in this. So our, the risks to security are much more if we don't have a gender perspective. And I think we're seeing this in the new and emerging threats that are coming out. Yeah, thank you for that. It's. Uh... It's quite remarkable in this COVID era, and hopefully we're coming into a post-COVID era, uh, that we see a, a change in the dynamic of what constitutes security, and that our traditional security frameworks are based on the actions of armed actors. But as we look at COVID health threats, as we look at climate change and the environment, we see that threats can come from other sources. And so I would like you to maybe reflect a little bit on the concept of human security that has emerged within NATO. During your tenure, you were double-hatted as also leading a human security unit. Can you help us better understand the, what is human security and why is NATO interested in, in this? Human security is not new to NATO. It's been it's been around. The concept has been around for many years. They've been working on it in our by strategic commands. 
um, what was different uh, at headquarters is that we had elements of human security and, and, and for NATO, human security at headquarters is uh, cultural property protection, protection of civilians, children on conflict, human trafficking. And then we have a, 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 an area that bridges everything, which is conflict related sexual violence. It doesn't belong in um, only human security. It is very much a one piece and security uh, uh, theme, but it, it's it's in within the whole uh, framework of human security. In 2019, and I came out of peacekeeping, where protection of civilians and children on conflict were very central um, to the work that was done in operationally. So I was very familiar with those uh, those subjects. And when I came on board to NATO, um, I was already asked to be a high level focal point on children on conflict. But these uh, these thematics, as, as they often referred to, were all over in different divisions. And I really thought that they needed to have a home, uh, somewhere that they could be connected, but also then underlined with women, peace and security, because the gender analysis that does underpin all of these is very important, but missing. Um, so worked with the nations and with uh, with the international staff to establish the human security unit. Um, now, my opinion of this is that I think it is it is unfortunate they're both together um, because women, peace and security for me is not, it is part of human security, but it should not be under an umbrella of human security because for human security in NATO, it's very much about protection. It's about the protection mandates of cultural property or of civilians or children. If you simply limit women, peace and security to just protection, you are missing totally the empowerment element that is so important uh, for the agenda, but for women. You cannot have protection without empowerment. Women have to be agents in their own destiny, in their own vision for the future. And so I worry that when we merge the two agendas, in a way, we are reducing both of them. And the women, peace and security agenda, and of course, there's also tension between the communities. Women, peace and security purists, in a way, don't like the human security tag. And quite often you have protection of civilians on the same or children on conflict also pushing back. But I do think we need to find a place to work together because, again, those who miss out on protection strategies are often women and children, women and girls. Um, those who miss out often in protection sexual violence can be men and boys. Um, so we have to find a middle ground where we, we work together. But I personally, from experience of having headed up the Human Security Unit, but also being the special rep on One Piece of Security, find the disconnect is more than the connect and that we, we are doing a disservice to both of those mandates. And I found it very difficult um, to explain uh, as we further went on where the line between the two uh, was and where it was uh, where the, the connection or disconnect was yes. um and i yes. do fear in the future because there is a momentum to push these together but one because it can save money but another because you know on the ground there is a holistic approach to this but i think we have to be vigilant because we have fought very hard for women peace and security and we fought for women's rights to be at the forefront of negotiations of peace processes of, of leadership do we put ourselves in harm's way by merging this and, and discounting it in, in a way so that it's all under one protection mandate? And that is a worry for me as it, it moves forward. And, and I have advised that those two things do be disconnected. Yeah, it sounds like a big yeah. challenge for your predecessor who, uh, who will sort that out. And certainly within the human security agenda, we see the ability to look at security uh, as part of the whole of the population and looking at all the risks and threats uh, to that population. And we need this type of analysis, uh, particularly not only in conflict situations, but post-conflict situations. This event today is really also uh, trying to ask a very difficult question about what happened in Afghanistan and where do we go from here in terms of both the empowerment and protection of women and girls in Afghanistan. And just given all that has happened in the last uh, month or so since the fall of Kabul, I'm wondering if you could just share your personal thoughts with us about 
NATO's involvement and where to go from here? Yeah, like uh, everyone, I was uh, disheartened and heartbroken about what had happened in Afghanistan. We had uh, worked, uh, and, and my uh, predecessors, uh, those wonderful women whose shoulders I stood upon, um, had worked before I even arrived in NATO uh, in close cooperation with uh, women's civil society in Afghanistan. And we had a civil society advisory panel where we had uh, Mabuba, um, who was uh, had founded the Afghan Women's Network uh, as, as one of our um, members and who was telling us for, for quite a while uh, the situation on the ground. And we brought uh, also from the Afghan Women's Network to the council and they briefed the council. One thing I, I think, and this is a message for the international community writ large, is that we are not doing enough early warning analysis that involves women, that women's voices are is excluded still from looking at early warning signs. Um, and women on the ground in Afghanistan, as in any conflict country, can tell us what's happening if we simply tap into it. And unfortunately, I don't feel we're doing enough of that in the international community. We're still marginalizing women's voices when it comes to serious issues about security and defense. And so with Afghanistan, the question is, what do we do now? Um, yesterday, women from Afghanistan, as you as you probably know, uh, through Georgetown and a couple of nations, uh, brought together at the Security Council Afghan Women, and the, the women were very clear. The idea that engaging with Taliban is going to be the future, but it has to be conditional, and they have to be held accountable to the promises that they first put out about having diverse and inclusive government, about protecting women's rights and education. Um, and this was very clear. Uh, what they're also clear about, and what I think also cannot be up for negotiation is humanitarian aid. That must happen. Um, but negotiation and on conditionality of other aid, um, that has to take place. But conditions on humanitarian aid, the women are very clear, they, they don't want to see that. But we need to have regional support and we need to have regional support, Qatar, for example, to engage with the women in their leadership on what the potential is for women to go forward. Um, we need to have consistent messaging um, of the international community on women's rights. We cannot have some falling back behind the line and accepting certain uh, discriminatory or harmful practices and others not. And we have to be consistent about that. And we have to engage with women's civil society. Like I said about the early warning, women are not being included. For example, the delivery of humanitarian aid. Are we including women's voices from the ground? And I don't just mean the elite groups in maybe Kabul, but more diverse diverse women who don't always have access but have things to tell us. Um, the the, the de delivery of aid, which we've seen time and time again, we saw it in Haiti, we saw it in Somalia, where it's not taken into account a gender perspective, and therefore it's not being delivered to those who really need it. And so we need to have uh, good advice in terms of both gender and women's voices in, in delivery of aid and the humanitarian support. But also as we move, move forward, uh, we need to engage with civil, civil society. Women are saying they talk about us, but they don't talk to us. And this is happening a lot. And this hasn't changed. Uh, it's a continuum. So we need to change that. But we also need to, to do more about looking about Sharia and engaging women in the conversations on Sharia law. You know, uh, Islam has provisions for women's rights. And, and the Prophet Muhammad you know, talked about being having access to knowledge from the cradle to the grave. So it mm -hmm. isn't that education for women is not and should not be there. It absolutely is within uh, the, it, you know, the Islamic scholarship. It is within uh, uh, the understanding of Islam. Mm -hmm. So having conversations on Sharia law, having conversations with women about which way go, we go forward and really getting to what we can practically do, but not without women. And we have to stop doing this because it, time and time again, in every organization, women's voices are being excluded from the centrality of security, which is really about them and not only their future, but their safety. And I think we have to really hold ourselves to account a little bit more on this and see what more we can do because we can do and should do much better. 
Yeah, Claire, I'd like to pick up on uh, one point you made about the alliance and, and how unique NATO is, and that is that when NATO speaks with one voice, that collective action is very powerful. I mean, from where you sit now, do you think the alliance has had a chance to sit back and, and really reflect on how to have a united voice in terms of uh, the way that the nations are interacting with the Taliban, the way that uh, donors will give aid. And if, if we don't see this united voice, uh, what recommendations would you have to get to that point of unity in the message? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, NATO has generally always been with one voice. I mean, the idea of of, of how NATO takes takes forward. I mean, sometimes it is a bit of a, a maneuver to get to that one voice, but collectively, you know, in together, out together was always was always the uh, the mantra. Um, I think in in the future, I mean, NATO doesn't do developmental aid, and that's very much on on the donor community. But the individual nations of NATO are engaged in that, and I think that's they do have one voice with this. The problem is we can't have other nations um, who don't have that same. And, and it's how do we get into communication and, and, and conversation about everybody having a hard land and those nations who may not necessarily accept that. Um, we, cannot, we cannot step back from this. And quite often throughout my career, I have seen this in, in many organizations. When it comes down to the bottom line, we will not hold accountable just for women's rights. And that narrative has to change because this isn't just women's rights. This is security for everybody. And as women are saying, are we? Are, is the ground now set for further engagement terrorist activities? This isn't just women's rights. And, it, and, and as NATO moves forward, they will be doing lessons learned and we will be looking. And uh, when I was in NATO, we did an evaluation of, of the Women, Peace and Security mandate over 20 years. Um, and so this will be part of, of, I would think, the next steps where NATO goes and looking at what more can be done and on an operational sense as well, um, taking the lessons of, of Women, Peace and Security. But I think we need to do this. As a, as a group of international experts. I think that this needs to be done with the UN because, it, you know, there was failures in lots of places and there was also wonderful progress. But what could we have done? Could we have done more? I mean, that is a question. But I think certainly in terms of engaging women, we have to have this, this connective tissue that goes through all of the work we do as we move forward, not only on Afghanistan, but even in, in areas that are emerging in terms of, of, of fragility or uh, emerging in terms of conflict, we need to understand that the Women, Peace and Security mandate, that this agenda is not a marginalized on the cusp agenda, but it has to be centralized. 48% of the, of the population of Afghanistan are women. And that's 48% who aren't being included in the future, who aren't going to be having conversations about their lives. And that is not okay. And that should be not okay for anybody. Um, we have to do more. We have to do more to hold accountable and we have to do more to get women's voices at the forefront. Thank you for that. I really uh, want to pick up on the point that you made about even if uh, NATO acts with a unified voice on Afghanistan, that there are other actors involved in influencing the future direction of Afghanistan. I think this is very important because NATO has really uh, made an effort in recent years to expand its partnerships and alliances uh, with uh, nations and regional bodies outside of the traditional uh, set of stakeholders. And this is, of course, uh, very important because um, we need all nations to step up uh, to this agenda and have a more global application of women, peace and security. So thank you so much for that. And I just want to see, do you, uh, before we uh, turn to our distinguished panel, do you have any other remarks you'd like to share with us? I, I just, I just want to say, you know, it is 21 years, and and I think uh, we we have a lot to uh, to be appreciative of, and we have a lot to be proud of. Um, but I, I think we need to not rest. 
and we need a little bit more um, a courageous voice in moving this agenda forward. And I think collectively, we have to work together. And I do look forward to seeing um, where NATO goes next, because I know they're going to just build and build and build on this agenda, because they do understand the, the importance of it. And I know that uh, you have uh, Rachel from ACT, and you have uh, in ACO and uh, the by strategic commands. Um, and how NATO takes this forward, I think is you know going to be in, in, in hands of those who know the importance of this agenda. And I think that is very, very important. It's not a marginal issue. It is a security issue. And it's the security of everybody, women and men and children. Thank you so much, Claire. I want to thank you for your time today. And also uh, thank you for your leadership and personal courage in moving this agenda forward. And now I would like to turn over to uh, my colleague, uh, Corey Flesher, who's going to uh, start our distinguished panel today. Thank you, Corey. Over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Sarah and Claire, for your really illuminating discussion to highlight some of those key challenges and the context to really set the stage for this conversation. Um, Claire, thank you so much for all that you've done for NATO and what you've accomplished for the, the women, peace and security and the human security agendas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our panel. Um, my name is Corey Flesser. I am a senior specialist with the FORGE Group, um, and I am also a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council's Transatlantic Security Initiative. I am here to monitor the panel discussion today, or moderate, excuse me, the panel discussion today. Um, before I do so, a couple contextual uh, comments. Uh, I wanted to pick up on something I found so profound from Claire's discussion, and that was uh, we can't rest. And I think the, the discussion we're about to have here is really what does that look like as we look forward to the women, peace, and security agenda at NATO moving forward into 2030? And importantly, how do we reflect and understand those lessons learned from Afghanistan um, and really apply that to NATO's work moving forward? Um, to tackle these questions, I really do want to highlight our distinguished panel of guests. We have here next to me Sahana Dharmapuri. She is the director of Our Secure Future and has served as an independent advisor to NATO, USAID, the Swedish Armed Forces, and the United States Institute of Peace, as well as many other international developed organizations. Uh, welcome, Sahana. Thank you. And then as you'll see on the screen here, I have Lieutenant Colonel Rachel Grimes on Zoom. She is the liaison officer to the United Nations, ICRC, and NGOs at NATO Allied Command Transformation. Lieutenant Colonel Grimes has also previously worked with the UN and UK Armed Forces on implementing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and with human security objectives and has served on the NATO Committee on Gender Perspectives. As you also know, our final panelist is Sarah um, and thank you for joining us today on this panel. Thank you, Corey. Before we begin, I do want to note that and acknowledge that this conversation is incomplete without the voices of Afghan women, several of whom were unable to make it here today. The Atlantic Council, we're deeply committed to amplifying and elevating the voices of Afghan women, and we will continue to do so through future programming. So I encourage you all to be on the lookout for more updates on events that we have planned for the future. With that, let's dive into our conversation. And first, Sahan, I want to turn it over to you for any initial thoughts or reflections based on the fireside chat with Claire and Sarah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Corey. And thank you, Sarah and Rachel. It's great to see you. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, first, I, I just want to say, you know, as the director of our Secure Future, where we focus our Women, Peace, and Security program on including gender perspectives in security decision making, I can't um, think of a more timely subject and, and discussion to have. Um, it's really also a pleasure to see the Atlantic Council take up the issue and the focus on women, peace, and security. Um, yeah, the, there were many things that Claire said that were really um, important, I think, to underscore. I think her one of her statements that really sticks with me from your conversation, Sarah, is um, that women's voices are still not central to our idea of security decision making. And I think that um, this has been a constant tension in women, peace, and security since its inception is this uh, tension between protection and participation. And I think in this conversation, we were talking about participation as empowerment, but what 
I mean by that is the full participation of women's voices, which I think that is what we were referring to in the earlier discussion. Um, I think a couple ways that our secure future has looked at some of the issues that Claire raised about the issue of engaging male leaders is really important, and we've, we've tried to take that on in, in bringing male leaders together um, for off-the-record conversations and how they could promote uh, and champion gender equality, um, not just in the work environment, but in the actual day-to-day -day work of security decision-making. And then the second piece um, that might be also interesting for, for others, and I'd be happy to talk about it further, is the issue that Claire brought up about future issues of emerging technology and security risks and threats that we have to take a look at with a gender perspective. Our secure future, um, we did a report, a two-year study with my colleague, uh, Jolyn Shoemaker, called Project Delphi, which actually looked at using a gender perspective on the emerging trends in the digital ecosystem and actually finding that what's very helpful about using a gender perspective in security decision making is that it does help you identify early warning signals for uh, future weakness, conflict, instability. Um, and that, that there's much more to, to say about that, but, and I'll, I'll stop here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. 100%, I wanted to uh, pick up on something that you mentioned and turn it over to Rachel. Rachel, um, I think sometimes uh, I've heard it from a defense and security institution perspective. Sometimes it can be hard to figure out how we actually access um, and safely include women's voices and perspectives to make sure that um, our operations, our doctrine um, are informed. Um, and so, I, you know, some of the lessons learned from Afghanistan, as Claire highlighted, were that we, you know, we're talking about Afghan women without really getting their voices into the conversation to actively participate. And I was wondering, in your work that you do now with NATO, or even in your past um, uh, career, if you could give us some examples of, of how military and defense institutions can really seek out and safely integrate those kinds of perspectives, and a few examples of what that might look like from a, a defense and security institution perspective. Yes, yeah, certainly, Corey, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's great to um, say hello to everybody from the UK. And I always think it's a bit of a strange time to celebrate 1325 because for its 20th anniversary, we were all in self-isolation. Um, and now we can't really celebrate women's rights when we think of what's just happened in Afghanistan. But to answer your question then, Corey, I think in my um, experience, it's not just what I'm doing now, um, based at Allied Command Transformation. And the role of that headquarters, it's probably best for the audience to understand. So I'm not at the political level, um, but my job is to look at policy and then translate it into military activity. But I think I'll probably answer the questions today also heavily influenced by um, 30 years of being in the British military. Um, although I'm not a Lieutenant Colonel anymore, I'm, I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel, which makes me feel and look very old. But I think that from my experiences in Afghanistan in 2007 and in 2012, and more holistically looking at NATO's engagement in Afghanistan um, with women, I think it became quite clear when we started to look at counterinsurgency that unless you engage with the population, and I don't just mean the men, um, it was quite clear by about 2009 that our military commanders were saying we need to include women um, in the conversation, that if you want to do well in the counterinsurgency or indeed in any sort of operation, then it's about engaging with um, the men and the women in the community that you're working with. And I, although I'm using counterinsurgency, I think that this is relevant and it's something that we can take forward in the strategic concept um, and with NATO 2030, that it is listening and putting um, the civilian population at the centre of our planning, which will make us more successful in what we do. And I think in Afghanistan, we saw a couple of success stories um, in that, well, we structurally created military gender advisors and it was their role to, uh, to make sure that the, the planning of the headquarters was considering a gendered perspective. Now, ideally, it would be everybody in the headquarters that would be thinking about a gender perspective. But unfortunately, it was, as Claire pointed out, it was nascent to, to the military. 
And so we did need to use gender advisors, but we also created something called gender focal points so that within each of our branches in the military, we did have people that were trying to integrate a gendered perspective into it. And I think one of the, the big takeaways that um, the British military took, um, exploited, I suppose, is that we understood that we had to have single sex dialogue with women in Afghanistan. But back in our own country, we had to sit down and get civil society to come in and to talk to the defence minister. And I know that Canada has done this as well, where you've brought in your military planners, but you've also got women or men who are representing women's rights to tell the military leadership, look, this is really what it's like going on at the ground level. And to go back to the UK example, it was absolutely eye-opening to see the senior military of the UK, um, you know, basically being told by quite young women what the situation was like, not only in Afghanistan, but we had women from Iraq and women from Nigeria. And I think that that sort of engagement, if you can persuade your male leadership, it's predominantly male leadership, um, to sit down, to take time, to listen to these people who are non-traditional security actors. Um, I think that that's given both NATO and its members a lesson learned that we need to start identifying and sitting down and talking to these people even before we go into a country. Never mind when we're in the country, we should be doing this way in advance. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Certainly a lot to think about um, in those comments. Um, and I want to give Sarah an opportunity to really reflect on, you know, some of the things that Claire uh, has recently mentioned in her fireside chat, um, this focus on the civilian population and really understanding the gender perspectives throughout and how that might influence um, our ability to understand the dynamics, to get the ground truth. Um, and so, Sarah, I was really just hoping you could comment um, on your experience, some of those lessons learned from, from your uh, vantage point, from your experience working on these issues as long as you have. Yeah, thank you, Corey. I really uh, want to pick up on what Rachel was saying about the importance of listening to civil society and including them in the military planning and decision-making process. And um, so oftentimes when we uh, go into training and exercises that try to integrate uh, the civilian population, uh, there are surprises. You know, even uh, the experience of young children uh, can show us and teach us about the activities and behavior of armed groups in a given environment. And I think it's really different for every place. And this is what makes uh, both human security and women peace and security so unique. You need to do the analysis at the country level with the stakeholders in that environment in order to get a realistic picture of what you need to do to operationalize this agenda. It's not going to be the same in Afghanistan as it is in Syria, as it is in Yemen, as it is in Nigeria. It's going to be different. And having that contextualized framework is so important. And we can't do it without intentionality. And it takes effort of all leadership across all uh, branches of service, um, it takes leadership in, at the political level in civilian uh, government agencies to ask about the perspective of the local population to inform our strategy. And I think this is just such a critical factor that if we, if we really listen to people's voices, we would have a much better idea about how to offer safety and stability, uh, particularly in societies that were not uh, as well versed in their uh, their ground truth. You said a big phrase there. You said contextualized frameworks. And I think this is always the challenge for defense and security institutions in particular is, great, I understand exactly what you're saying. I totally, I, I buy into it. I think that's important. Now how do I do that? Um, and Sahana, I know you've done a lot of looking into areas um, 
like cybersecurity, climate change, maritime domain operations. Can you really talk through, these are, these are some of these areas that we haven't often seen a gender perspective applied. Um, if it has been applied, maybe we haven't seen as much of the research come out on it yet. But I was wondering if you could share information on what that looks like to apply a gender perspective to some of these uh, security topics that might not always come to mind. Thank you, yes, um, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more with um, what Sarah said. And to build on that um, in answering your question, when people, when we use the word gender perspective, it sounds so policy wonky and sort of mysterious. <laughs> what does that mean exactly? Um, and really what I'd like people, particularly in the security sector, to understand is it's another method of analysis, like any other method of analysis. It's another critical thinking skill. And the reason why we emphasize talking to women and girls so much is because in a sort of typical gender blind security assessment, we tend to approach a population as if it's monolithic, if it's one type of person. And we don't ask the specific questions that, for example, Sarah was saying. We don't ask further comprehensive, more nuanced questions about how different people in that population are experiencing their own security, their own needs and, and values differently at the same time in that security situation. So very simply, um, asking the question, how do men, women, boys and girls experience this situation in this area of operation differently? What are their needs and priorities? How are they different, mm -hmm. right? And then also asking, the second part of that is asking, how is, um, how is that behavior of those men, women, boys, and girls going to impact what we need to accomplish in our mission? Mm -hmm. That very much has a direct impact on the operational effectiveness of whatever you're trying to do. So that relationship is not a unilateral we are looking at them and they're gonna tell us what to do. It's a very much a feedback loop. Um, and this is why we really emphasize including women and girls' voices because that is a way, a method to include these other perspectives and these other insights into what is happening on the ground and what is happening to any security issue. So if you think about it as a critical analytical skill set, you can apply that lens or that method of analysis to any security problem or any potential threat that you have because the questions don't change. The problem changes that you're looking at. The lens that you're looking at it through is asking a different set of questions that's a bit more nuanced. Um, I might be going on in too much detail here, but yeah, um, I think that it does help us understand, for example, in the U.S. context, and uh, we, as everyone has had a, a lot of challenges with evacuation for, um, for people from Afghanistan, one of an interesting perspective that we can see if we use this gender lens is most of the special immigration visas were given to translators for, for the US, right? But most of the translators were male translators, which meant that most of the special immigration visas went to men and their family. Women had different roles in Afghanistan of maybe not being predominantly translators, but being journalists or educators or security officers or promoters of democracy. So they didn't qualify for the SIVs. They are in special categories of P2 or P1 at-risk categories, which have, in the US context has not been prioritized as much as special immigration visas or American citizen. So that's like a very like nutshell using a gender perspective where we can then see, oh, there's a, there's a difference in the way men and women are being treated in, in our evacuation plans. What could we do to correct this? What risks or failures or weaknesses does that lead to if we have this imbalance? That's just an example. 
Thank you for getting into that level of detail, though, <laughs> because I think that's very important sometimes where if you don't work mm -hmm. on these issues day to day like all of us do, you're really looking for those tangible examples of what does this mean when it plays out um, in a practical way. Uh, and something I was thinking about as you were talking is the uh, sort of inherently gendered nature of human security. It came up during uh, your conversation with Claire, Sarah, and you know, Rachel, I know you have done a lot of work on the human security for the UK, and I was wondering, um, could you, you know, tell us about how you viewed the relationship between women, peace and security and human security and help us deconflict sometimes that tension that exists between those two agendas? You're muted. Rachel, are you? Can Rachel? Can you try to unmute yourself real quick? Um, am I now? Yep, yeah. got you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think somebody else has got control of the mute. It's a bit scary. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, from a UK perspective, um, we looked at certain topics that we felt were being um, not fully absorbed into military planning. And they were the subjects such as human trafficking, children in armed conflict, protection of civilians, all of which have a huge gender dynamic. It, I, and I don't mean that it impacts on women in, in only, they impact on men, women, boys and girls in different ways. And so we weren't really looking at those subjects, uh, those topics in, in NATO, we call them the cross-cutting topics. Um, we weren't looking at them as, uh, as fully as we could. But also, and it, and it shames, it hurts me to say this, and it's slightly embarrassing, but when you're in a male-dominated organization and you are trying to talk about women, peace and security, or you foolishly use the word gender, you can alienate your audience. And for me, what was more important was that the male audience would come with me on this journey of implementing 1325. Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to spend 10 or 15 minutes of a lesson talking about um, LGBTQT or the rights of women in the military, which the word gender seemed to spark that sort of response. So from a UK perspective, and it might have changed because I, I left last year, um, but we just started to use human security, but we were absolutely founded in a gendered perspective and in looking at women, peace and security. My only concern with the word human security is it does lead to that protectionist aspect and it doesn't necessarily empower women, which is a, a key part of the women, peace and security agenda. But I think that if you look at Joint Service Publication 1325, you do um, you can see that there is an empowerment aspect to it because it goes back to um, what the other speakers have said today. It's not just about asking questions; it's who is asking the question to the local community. And so there were two aspects on the on the participation of women. It was making sure that we were talking to women in local communities, um, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan or, or for uh, NATO, whether it's Kosovo, but also who was asking the questions, because did we really want to have men in uniform asking those questions? And if we didn't have civilians there, could we use women in uniform? And I know that this takes us into a rabbit hole of why did women join the army? Did women join the military to talk to civilian women? Well, possibly they didn't, but I remember my own experience in Afghanistan is that men had to spend, men in uniform, NATO staff, had to spend a lot of time talking about crops and the weather with in all male surers. And I know that from talking to colleagues, they used to say, oh, you know, we spent two hours talking about tea and coffee and, and the weather, and we didn't really get on to the location of the Taliban or the security situation. So I think that men sometimes are used in a way that, they didn't join the military for. So I, I don't have that much sympathy when people say that women in the military are burdened when they have to talk to other women, because ultimately, what's the objective of your mission? And if you've got somebody that can help you achieve that mission, a bit like speaking a foreign language, um, we should use them, we should exploit them um, to achieve a mission. Thank you. I wanted to, uh, you know, I thought it was really powerful when you said the phrase, who is asking the questions, as being a key point of this entire conversation. 
Uh, and Sarah, it made me think about some of the ongoing discussions um, between the international community and the Taliban and the different types of delegations that they're sending. Um, a lot of these are predominantly male, so it is the men who are asking the questions. And I wanted to you know, pick your brain here. Like, What are some different options we could use to you know, get more diverse delegations, include more women's voices? Uh, what would that look like um, in those discussions, knowing that the Taliban is, uh, you know, sort of against, is against women's rights and sort of this backsliding that we're seeing? Yeah, thank you, Corey. I think it's really interesting. You know, this week we've seen quite a bit of media attention around the issue about whether uh, donor countries and humanitarian agencies should negotiate directly uh, with the Taliban without uh, any female representatives. And within the humanitarian sector, uh, the concept of humanitarian protection is a little bit uh, unique to the military concept. And it's really about keeping people safe from fear. And right now, we have to acknowledge that Afghan women and girls are afraid for their lives. Many of the champions who we would have liked to have welcomed on the stage with us today are actually in safe houses or not available to come out into the public space right now. And this just reminds me of when I worked um, on United Nations programs in southern Afghanistan in Kandahar, when I had a protection problem and someone was afraid for their lives, and particularly when they were afraid by someone uh, in the police or in the National Army, I would actually take those people with me to meet with the governor of the province. And I did that for a reason, because I could have gone to meet with the governor by myself and said, you know, I'm having this problem in this camp and I'd like you to fix it for me. But I brought the people with me so that all of the governor's aides and assistants could see that I wanted these people to be protected people, and I did not want anyone to mess with them anymore. And I think the message that we're sending when the heads of humanitarian agencies who understand this protection element do not bring the people with them who they are charged with protecting and say, these people are our partners, they're critical stakeholders, do not abuse these women. Instead, we have those women in safe houses protesting in the street. Why aren't we protecting them as an international community? And representation is part of protection. We cannot get away from that. And so I think this is a really challenging moment that really excites me that the Atlantic Council and others want to get involved because we have to have courage, like Claire said, and move the nations to stand up for women and stand behind women and to bring women with us so that we make better progress on the road ahead. Thank you. I, uh, it's just such a powerful statement and I'm so appreciative of you for sharing that experience. Um, I do want to remind the audience that we are opening it up for a question and answer session so you can tweet at the Atlantic Council or at AC Scrowcroft. Um, to submit questions, or you can also submit them in the Zoom chat. Um, but we're going to continue the conversation and let us know if more uh, discussion questions come in. Uh, Sahana, you do a lot of work with the U.S. because I think you know, uh, Sarah, when you say um, the when you highlight the different um, contributions of each nation, I know that the United States very power a power player inside of NATO. Um, and Sahana, I wanted to get your take on what the U.S. is doing in this space, where we're going looking forward, um, and maybe tie that into you know, some of the ways that we can be that type of uh, partner within NATO to advance the agenda. Yeah, thanks, Corey. And um, thanks, Sarah, also for your passion um, and your commitment to the work. Um, yeah, I'm, again, I'm speaking from a civil society perspective. Um, we actually helped stand up the first Women, Peace, and Security bipartisan congressional caucus in the U.S. Congress. And today we have um, 25 members, bipartisan Republican and Democrat members, who have committed to this issue. Um, and three of the participating members in the, in the caucus have actually submitted amendments to the current um, NDAA include that 
actually highlight this issue of um, evacuation from Afghanistan and, and, and highlighting the importance of Afghan women and girls, particularly Representative Spears' um, amendment on P2 that rec recognizes Afghan women and girls. But more importantly than that, in 2017, the Congress actually passed the Women, Peace, and Security Act, which actually makes a commitment, a legal commitment, to include women um, in uh, negotiations, peace negotiations, and participation in security decision making. It requires the State Department, Department of Defense, DHS, USAID to all have implementation plans on women, peace, and security. So some of the uh, personal examples that, that Sarah was, was providing um, are really important. And also, to Claire's point, it's very important to have women, peace, and security integrated into actual doctrine or policy agendas. So now in the US, we have a legal commitment and, or I would say legal obligation, and also policy commitments in these agencies that actually are, that play a key role in our national security and foreign affairs. Um, there are, I think one, one of the main challenges for the US is how are we going to actually honor our commitment? Because we haven't seen that happen, to be honest. And we really need to do a lot more in engaging Afghan women in the decision-making process and civil society in the, these uh, security decision-making processes. Um, I think one of our panelists said uh, the phrase, you know, in including non-traditional security actors in security decision making, I don't know if it was, it was Rachel or someone else, but I, I think one of us at some point have said that, um, because it is a key point of women, peace, and security is actually one of the most, um, I, I think, striking security innovations that has come out in the 21st century is this idea that civil society has a role to play in the black box of security governance and security decision making. And today, actually, from a civil society perspective, we have uh, more than 95 countries, I think it might be 98, 99 countries, that have national action plans today. I think something like 36% of those national action plans actually have a budget, which is very important, because if you have a policy priority, it's always nice to have some funding behind it to actually be able to implement it. 36% is not you know, 100%, but we'll take it. Um, and then 70, I think about 70 countries, 70 of those national action plans actually specify a role for civil society to play in um, decision making. So that's great that we have all this paper and all this policy. I think it's how are we going to implement it to your statement earlier. It's we have the commitments, we have the policy um, written out in the frameworks. But we are going to have to, instead of relying on uh, courageous actions like you know, Sarah described or Claire might have experienced or Rachel, um, we really need to make it sy systemic in our thinking. And we need to make use of the laws and the policy we have created. Um, so that, I mean, I can go on for more about that, but <laughs> I'll stop there. Sarah, do you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment for our audience, really, about the term civil society, because mm -hmm. I found working with, within a military environment that this term is often not well understood. So oftentimes, at the political level, we're negotiating with very high-level stakeholders in government or elite groups of people. And particularly for the humanitarian community, we're working with the most vulnerable people, the most needy people, um, the most challenging cases. But civil society is really that middle space of people who are actively engaged in the life of their neighborhoods, their towns, uh, their communities. They can be business leaders. They can be uh, socially organized groups, educators. They can be the, the leaders of the people who uh, may not be at the very top of the spear, and they are also not at the bottom. But they're the productive members of society who are self-organizing to offer the types of solutions uh, that Sahan is talking about. So I just want to clarify that term uh, for our audience. 100%, it's an important caveat. 
Rachel, I wanted to uh, ask you a question. Uh, working at NATO ACT, uh, we're all eagerly anticipating the updates to the NATO strategic concept. Yes, this is a policy document, and to Sahana's point, it is important to see these policy documents come out. Um, but uh, Rachel, from your perspective and where you sit working inside of NATO, uh, what, it, what is the importance of including women, peace and security and human security in that strategic document and how will that help you continue the work that you're doing? Well, this, the strategic concept is, um, is at that political level that I explained. I'm not quite working up there at Allied Command Transformation, but the staff within Allied Command Transformation absolutely are given the opportunity. Um, and in fact, the branch that I work in, the policy and plans branch, we've got um, a couple of people who are supporting the work at headquarters NATO in Brussels with the, uh, with the drafting of it. But it is vital that you have this language at whether it's the um, strategic concept, whether it's NATO 2030, which, Cory, I know that you've been working on with the, the Reflections Group, um, or if it's something like the NATO warfighting capstone concept, which is something that is definitely being driven by Allied Command Transformation, which is much more at the military level. Um, if the language is missing on women, peace and security or broader considerations such as human trafficking, children in armed conflict, then it makes it very challenging for the, the operators on the ground to, to implement it. And I think I said at the beginning that my job is to, to translate that policy language into military activity. And unfortunately, if the language isn't succinct and it, it, and it isn't obvious enough rather, then it can be overlooked. And, and we can see this also with UN Security Council resolutions, whether it was for Afghanistan or, or whether it was for, um, I don't know, operations in Bosnia. You really do need to have specific language telling the political, telling the, the um, North Atlantic Council that they have to consider women, peace and security. And then they, somebody has to ensure that it gets into the military committee and that it gets into the NATO planning policy. Now, luckily, NATO now has um, specific dedicated military gender advisors in all of their headquarters. And so those those officers um, definitely get a chance to shape the to shape the planning from from a military perspective. But yes, my, my point would be if the language is missing, then um, then you're going to miss out on the tactical activity. I mean, at the end of the day, what the um, North Atlantic Council wants is for a military person to be on the ground and to know that they should go and talk to civil society, is to know how they should respond to somebody that says to them, I've been attacked, I've been sexually abused. What we don't want are military personnel that think, well, that's not my area of work, that's for the humanitarians to do. And I do feel that NATO is definitely making progress in getting the military to think this way, that they are not just focused on an adversary, but if they're not there to protect civilians, then what's the point of them being there? So get the language in. And um, if you can lobby people outside of the organization um, to, to make sure that the ambassadors around the table in NATO headquarters say, what about women, peace and security? Where, where's the language on human security? Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. I think you really highlight the importance of how once you see these important words in a, in a policy document, it then gives people the ability to translate them into doctrine, into training, into education, uh, to really make sure that we arm military forces with the education and training they need to, seek, to get those outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, we did receive one question that I wanted to ask our panelists. Um, it comes from Anne Moisan. and thank you so much for joining us today. She asks, uh, or she notes, all speakers noted the strong Taliban views on women and their rights. But realistically, what instruments of real persuasion does the international community have to demand the Taliban accept conditions and effect real change? Uh, is there political will in the international community to do this? It's a heavy question. Anybody want to jump on it? I, th I would just say that I think there's a very real financial incentive uh, for the Taliban, um, not in terms of um, their own uh, compensation, but the, the way the macroeconomic situation in Afghanistan is unfolding in a very 
real uh, way there is a financial crisis of liquidity and solvency of the banks. And I think we haven't talked about the role of the private sector, but certainly the private sector has a role to play as well, whether it's through the emerging technologies and cyberspace, but also with financing. We know that a country can't operate without a, a national bank and without private mechanisms for people to have solvency. And so for the, for the sake of the cash flow of the government, uh, there needs to be a way to financial stability. I think that's one point of leverage uh, that needs to be further explored. Um, can I jump in, Corey? Oh, 100%, Rachel, and then we'll go to Sahana. Great. Um, because I, I mean, I was a little bit, um, obviously, I think all feminists have been depressed with what's happened in recent months. But then I thought about what ISAF had achieved. And I mean, when you think about it, in 20 years, um, the country went to having 3 million girls educated, 50,000 women went to university. I think NATO created the conditions for women to go to elections. Definitely member states were helping women to, to get into the political, um, to get into the lawyer jerga and to, and to the government. And in fact, I think in 2018, there was an amazing statistic when there was something like 28% of women in parliament, sorry, 20% were women in parliament in Afghanistan, which was actually bigger, a larger number than many of the Western governments. And so what I'm hoping is that if people are going to negotiate or talk to the Taliban, often you hear people such as the Taliban say that women aren't ready to, to take part in politics. They're not educated. They've, they've got no experience. But I think that the last 20 years have has provided empirical evidence that women can work. There are women in banks, women, women in government. And so they don't really... I don't think it's a strong argument for them to come back and say, you know, the situation is not right for women because we've proved it can be done. I mean, it wasn't easy and it definitely wasn't perfect. But I hope that when countries are going and negotiating with the Taliban, that they will recall that actually women did work, girls were educated. And going back to Sarah's point, it will help the country get out of this dire financial crisis. Countries where women work are economically and more stable um, than countries which don't allow women to work or girls to have education. So I hope that we can bring some of the, the, the more positive aspects of the ISAF mission um, into the current and the next stages of, of dealing with the Taliban. Thank you. Go ahead. So um, I have been thinking about a sort of out of the box um, idea of leverage that we have, and it's really framed in the great power competition conversation that is uh, very strongly happening now in Washington. Um, I mean, it starts from the premise of if we leave the field, we've left a vacuum. Who will fill it? And I think that we have seen China step in um, and normalize some relations with the Taliban, Taliban regime. Um, I think it would be prudent to start exploring some, at least start exploring some common interests that China and the U.S. might have with the Taliban to at least um, explore the idea of a humanitarian corridor. And I think that one of the common interests is this economic interest that the Taliban has with China. Um, and it would allow the U.S. in having that cooperation to provide protection to um, actually safely evacuate American citizens. Um, it may not be the most liked idea, but it's certainly something that is worth exploring. And I don't think that it would, um, I actually think it would help the US in the great power competition narrative. Um, and then additionally, I think for NATO and the U.S., like in the U.S., we have the Ali Wiesel Act, Genocide Prevention Act. We also have the Global Fragility Act, which requires um, an atrocity prevention strategy. So at the very least, the, the U.S. and NATO allies could start form some, doing some policy formulation on atrocity prevention or atrocity or risk assessment strategies. And of course, as we've been saying this whole time, 
um, non-traditional security actors must be part of that policy formulation. They must be consulted and not just consulted and check the box, but those um, views must be incorporated into the way that we think about security or atrocity prevention and um, the ability to, d to degrade um, harm. So, I think that's a great point um, often because we so we so often hear in the women, peace, and security agenda this concept of meaningful participation, and what does that mean? But it actually is this moving beyond the check in the block um, just to get it done, but really figuring out how to incorporate those perspectives and the things that we're working on. Uh, and I like that you brought up the humanitarian aspect because it dovetails into one of our next questions. Uh, this is from Nina Laoud. She's the board of directors for the International Legal Assistance Consortium. Uh, on the comment of NATO that needs, uh, on the comment that NATO needs to further work with the UN on the women, peace, and security framework, how do you envision such collaboration proceeding given how complicated this can be? Uh, and maybe, you know, Sarah, I'm looking at you, I'm thinking about your background. Rachel, I'm also thinking about your background as well. And so I'll start with either of you, and then I, I'm sure Sahana probably has some thoughts for us. So whoever wants to jump in first. I, I would just say, um, I'll let Rachel speak to the UN, but I, um, I would say that, you know, there was a great article that came out this, this week from uh, an, an Afghan woman leader who said that, you know, uh, the women, peace and security agenda is not a Western agenda. And I think it's really important to state that um, there are other global leaders in this space at a regional level. You have um, within the Gulf states and the Arab League, you have nations that have national action plans and that have advocated at the UN on behalf of other um, countries. And so I think we have to remember that it doesn't always have to be the US or a NATO member that sets the example that we really need to look to other regional relationships that perhaps have a different uh, level of influence on uh, leaders in Afghanistan and I would say Pakistan as well. And I, I know Rachel knows more about the, the UN's and NATO cooperation, so I'll let her take that. Well, I, I hope if there's anyone from the UN listening that they'll agree that I think NATO and the UN have a really positive um, working relationship. I mean, I was talking to uh, my, so not my opposite number because I'm not the gender advisor in ACT, but I was talking to the military gender advisor in the United Nations Office of Military Affairs. And we were just sharing ideas um, and also it was a little bit like Alcoholics Anonymous because we were both sharing with each other how tough it can be sometimes to try and get courses and training um, agreed with by in male dominated organizations. So she was definitely a secure, um, what's the word? She was like a, a crutch for me as well to talk to her. But we're in, we are working not necessarily with each other but we're giving each other advice on what's worked for the UN what's worked for NATO I mean clearly um, all of the NATO members and its partners are in the UN so the more that we can share language I think that that will make it easier um, whether it's a UN mission that the military are on or a NATO mission that the military are on if we can um, agree that we're using similar terminology and, and not introducing new terminology to confuse people but I feel from a, a military perspective, um, it's NATO has a, a really good experience and uh, sorry, um, yeah, has a good experience of working with the UN. We've got um, two officers who are based in New York. So, so they are regularly over at the UN security um, at the sec secretariat. Sorry. Um, but so I, I'm not sure what, what the um, what the speaker is thinking about, if there is somewhere where we could be working more. But certainly from my perspective, I, I'm in contact with the UN and people like the International Committee of the Red Cross on quite a regular basis. Thank you. Yeah, um, would like to underscore something that Sarah and Rachel uh, said two different things. One is, um, yes, women, peace and security is not a Western agenda and actually originated with Ambassador Anwarul Chowdhury from Bangladesh when he had the presidency of the Security Council, which just underscores uh, Sarah's point that there are other, there's other places to look for leadership. Um, but at the same time, Rachel, uh, I think her point about um, 
the cooperation and, and the, the key uh, importance of that multilateralism plays, I think, is very important, um, and that's something that NATO and the UN offers, and I think in the world that we're in today, we can't actually use it enough, like multilateral approaches and cooperation and dialogue. Um, I would say uh, another one other aspect for me it, that I have learned in in what we've seen with the with the fall of Kabul and the way, the way that the U.S. handled the, the drawdown in Afghanistan, the way that we think about security. Um, I think for too long the S in WPS has been thought of, in, in, that type of security has been really focused on gender-based violence or sexual gender-based violence. Um, and it sort of mo had moved away from some of the original intent of looking at improving protections of all civilians, of involving women in decision-making in humanitarian crisis or disaster relief. Basically, having women as agents of change using a gender perspective on security decision-making, on security cooperation, for example, right? So I think in the vein of multilateralism, in the vein of looking for to, to other countries or even NATO and the UN uh, countries for leadership, security cooperation I think has been really underrated or mostly emphasized in terms of um, increasing women's representation when we could be using security cooperation much better for things like how could we have done an evacuation better? How can we do better protection of civilians? How can we um, do an atrocity risk assessment or any security um, risk assessment? Or how do we do security cooperation on new and emerging threats with a gender perspective? Those are all things that are, I know, much higher level thinking, but all things that any members of the UN and, and NATO can do in cooperation with each other. Yeah, you really, you raise a great point there because it, it's really how we take those core concepts of women, peace and security, human security, and embed them into how we do partnerships and security cooperation. So they're part of it. They're not the additional thing we do with them. So it's just part of how we do security cooperation or partnerships or engagement. We did receive another question from John Agoglia. Hi, John, thanks for joining. Have you worked on developing situational training exercises that involve women, peace, and security to train our operational commanders? And what should these include? And Rachel, as our resident retired military officer, I do want to give you the right of first refusal. So I'm going to kick this one to you. And then Sarah, I know you've also developed training. So I do want to give you an opportunity to weigh in. Well, actually, um, Allied Command Transformation and Land Warfare Center in, in Stavanger in Norway, they work quite closely with each other on developing exercises and absolutely for sure um, there are exercises scenarios being developed but have been developed um, in previous exercises which have a women peace and security um, will test people's understanding of women peace and security i think one thing that will be interesting is that um I think most organizations view women, peace and security as something that we do in other countries in um, in out of area operations. And I think as NATO is moving towards Article 5 um, mission training and also looking at how NATO is building its resilience with, with making sure that all of its member states are prepared for whatever might be. The, the challenge will be, and that's something that I think the Gender Advisory Transformation is already working on, is how we get these new challenges, these new security dynamics into an Article 5 mission. And how do we get out of people's minds that you only do with peace and security in a humanitarian disaster? Um, so it is happening, but it needs to be finessed to look at emerging and technologies. But I feel with counterterrorism, um, NATO's gender perspective is very strong and how it in how it includes it in exercises. But I like the point about maybe having specific scenarios to test the senior leadership. Um, that's something that I'll take back with me and, and we'll see if we can make some scenarios that just that the uh, senior leadership would have to be would have to deal with. So thanks for the idea. Absolutely. We, we, uh, we didn't know that we were creating do-outs from this meeting, but certainly there's some great ideas that have been generated among our panelists. 
Uh, Sarah, did you want to amplify any comments? Uh, yeah, I would just say that, you know, a number of the U.S. Um, regional combatant commands have developed women, peace and security uh, training and exercises. And then, of course, uh, through security cooperation partnerships, uh, I've, I've been part of integrating uh, gender indicators into these uh, large scale trainings. And one of the lessons is always that if if the intelligence analysis does not include the gender perspective or the civilian perspective, then it doesn't go to operations. So I think uh, for those of you who are involved in uh, these large scale trainings, you know it runs the full uh, gamut of all the military role in operations. And you have uh, many different divisions that have different roles. And that is where this falls down all the time, is that if the analysis of the conflict environment does not include these factors, then that doesn't become an operational plan. And then what happens is the plan goes wrong. And I, I'm one of those people who loves to make the plan go wrong because then it shows people you needed to include this in your analysis in order to have the right plan. But oftentimes um, you have very well thought out plans and, and operations go wrong because you failed to analyze the real driver of the conflict, which may be something different than what you expected. So uh, love to talk about this more. Offline. <laughs> well, sadly, we only have about five minutes left in our program yeah. today, Sarah. That is for yeah. another topic. Another but time. <laughs> I, I'd like to yeah, add to that, too, uh -huh. that um, it, underscoring what Sarah was saying um, about the combatant, U.S. combatant commands doing exercises and trainings. I've been, as civil society, been involved and invited to participate in those exercises, and I think I'm one of the wrenches that gets thrown into, into the training. Um, but I, I do think that's another do out from this conversation is for um, when we do prepare these types of trainings for senior leadership or to operationalize things that, um, whether it's the NATO context or the UN context or US, that really we need to do a better job of involving civil society experts and gender experts in the actual exercises and trainings. Um, I've been very honored to be invited to participate in those, and it has really taught me a lot, too, about how to translate the Women, Peace, and Security agenda to security actors in a way that is a lot more useful and practical than perhaps the civil society language that I've been using. So I think it's a two-way street in, in terms of learning and practice. Uh, the translation. Sorry, can I just follow on from that? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Rachel. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and, and definitely, I'm going to invite you all to come to our next um, scenario development because it will be great to have you. But something that we are doing um, in, in Allied Command Transformation is that rather than creating a new course that looks at all these new, uh, well, sorry, not new, but looks at the human security topics and women, peace and security um, is not to make a new new course. We've got a great course that's run by the Nordic Center for Gender and Military Operations, but is to look at the courses which NATO delivers at Oberammergau and to look at particularly at the J2, which is our intelligence course, to look at our targeting course and working with the likes of the International Committee of the Red Cross and you know, people that are on this panel today, is we're going to try and incorporate language which will teach the participants on wider issues about women, peace and security, but just within the lane of say, intelligence. Um, and, and, and both Sahara and Sahara talked about um, human terrain analysis. And that's definitely something that we've started to do, but we could build on. But what we'll try and do is to blend it into the training that's already available rather than designing new courses. So I just wanted to share yeah, that because it is being done, but it, it could. I, I, I agree that we could make it a little bit more sophisticated, and hopefully, with the Oberammergau course um, training, then that will support it when we have troops out who have to deal with spoilers like you two. Thank you. 
Well, you've all certainly given us a lot to think about. Um, I do have to wrap it up. We are at time for our program. So first, thank you to the panelists for all your comments and sharing your expertise and insights working on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. Thank you to our audience members for joining in with us this morning. We're always happy to have you. Um, and finally, please do stay tuned for more events coming out of the Atlantic Council on Gender and Security. Enjoy your weekends. <laughs>